Yeah, Prof. I think we can move on. One. This yeah. is the last uh, topics of topics. The challenges of poverty in Muslim countries. Yeah, the challenges of poverty in Muslim countries. All right. Uh, yeah, we have to accept the fact that actually Muslims are twenty percent of the global populations now. But then from that twenty percent of the global populations, Abani, fifty percent of the world's poorest people live in the Muslim world. If the percent, yeah, uh, if you were to if you were to 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 to, to count the, the 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 poor in all over the world, fifty percent of the world poorest people live in the Muslim world. This is the fact, and uh, some are saying that every one in five Muslims uh, live in extreme poverty. Uh, I, I think we cannot see this in 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 uh, Brunei, but overall. They are saying in all over the world, in all over the Muslim world, uh, within five Muslims, there must be one who are living in extreme poverty. And also we can see that from a bigger picture, out of 57 uh, OIC member countries, OIC is the Organization of Islamic Countries, uh, 25 member states of sub-Saharan African countries are amongst the most poverty stricken countries in the world, uh, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. And Alhamdulillah, uh, undoubtedly that the, there are a lot of endeavors and also uh, efforts of the governments, of the people to overcome the problems of poverty. But uh, I can see uh, there are at least four uh, things which we need to be, uh, we, which we need to improve in order to overcome the challenges, the poverty of the Muslim countries. The first one of the management of poverty. You see, when we read any references or any writings or any reports, uh, many of them are using the terms alleviation of poverty, or some of them using a more, uh, a more, a more, in a, a more energetic or more, in a, uh, they, they use the, the term elimination of poverty. They want to eliminate altogether. And the elevation is means that to decrease the, the poverty, yeah? uh, to reduce the poverty, but the elimination is too, too many. I, I think this is quite ambitious. And in fact, it is a kind of dreams because if you see in the history of the human beings, we have yet to see any times of the history of human beings that there was no poor at all, no poverty at all. Yeah, uh, even in the, uh, the in the in the in the in the uh, many times of the uh, Umar Ibn Al Aziz, yeah, many are saying uh, during Umar Ibn Al Aziz, yeah, there are no people who want to accept the zakah, zakah. But that doesn't mean, yeah, from my study, that doesn't mean that. There were no poor people who are uh, qualified to accept the zakat, but they want to. They don't want to accept the. Uh, they want. They don't. They don't want to accept the zakat because they have a kind of feeling which we term as kanaa or satisfied with with what uh, they have with what they have. So uh, elimination of poverty is quite uh, imaginary. Uh, and also it's quite uh, impossible, it's, 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 it's actually uh, definitely impossible. Uh, even though the elevation, I think it's not the right concept to be in overcoming the challenges of poverty in Muslim countries, but instead we have to have the management of poverty. Uh, we are actually uh, need to manage the poverty, to manage the poor, rather than to eliminate the poor or to elevate the poor, yeah? So the management is very, very important because we can see during the sirah, in the sirah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even uh, during the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there were also poor people. There were also poor people like uh, uh, what we term as uh, Ali Sufa. Uh, Ali Sufa is a group of people uh, living uh, at the veranda of the Masjid Nabawi, uh, they, ha they don't have the family, they don't have any assets, and they just stay there and learn with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. 
uh, and they were considered from our perspective now as the unemployed. And in fact, if you can see that if you see it from our perspective now, for our conventional uh, perspective, uh, we can uh, claim that uh, they are actually in absolute power, in absolute poverty, because they have nothing, including their foods, their drinks. Yeah. Uh, but Rasulullah Sallallahu uh, had never asked them to work or to become rich, to work or to become rich. Uh, they were allowed that, and then, uh, but at the same time, there are Sahaba, the companions of Rasulullah Sallallahu who are rich who were rich like Abraham bin Auf, you know, Osman bin Affan, and in fact, we were told that Selina Abraham bin Auf used to come to Rasulullah Sallallahu uh, asking Rasulullah um, for his permissions to become poor. Uh, so when Abraham bin Auf wanted to become poor because uh, when he was told that uh, uh, he will be one of the Sahaba who will enter the Jannah uh, in a later times, because he needs to do the hisab of his uh, assets, of his uh, wealth, and uh, so forth. Uh, so Abdul Rahman bin Auf wanted to go into the Jannah as soon as possible, and therefore uh, uh, he wanted to give up all his wealth and to give it to Baitul Mal. But Rasulullah SAW didn't allow that to happen. And Rasulullah SAW uh, was saying that you need to be rich. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we were asking actually why uh, Abdul Rahman uh, bin Auf, Sayyidina Abdul Rahman bin Auf, allowed to be rich and then the Ali Sufa allowed to be poor. So from there, we can try to see uh, the, 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 the implications of that or the, the uh, or what actually happening is this. Uh, Ahli Sufa uh, allowed, were allowed to be rich and uh, to be poor because they do not disturb the community. Yeah, they do not disturb community by by asking people to help them. No, they do they don't do that. Uh, if we say that they are unemployed, it is not true because their tasks are to learn from whatever uh, from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they went out to do the da'wah to dis disseminate whatever that they got from Rasulullah Sallallahu uh, Alaihi to other brothers and sisters. And then as in sign, whenever there is a call for jihad, they were the people who who who, who, who will go first uh, to the front to go to jihad. So actually they have the works to do. They have the works to do. So, But then because we uh, measure the poor, the poverty, based on our materials, uh, the incomes, uh, the employment, and therefore we allege them as being poor. Yeah, uh, and then Abraham went out. Rasulullah uh, sallam allow him to be rich because he is very uh, philanthropic. Whenever Rasulullah sallam needs any helps, any monetary helps. So Abraham and Bra'u will come and will give uh, his wealth to the needs of Islam, to so Baytumah, uh, so that Islam uh, will, uh, will, will uh, develop and also Baytumah uh, Maju, inshallah. Yeah. So we can see that from here, actually, poverty and rich is much more of a selective kind of uh, affairs. So what we need to do is just to manage the poverty, to manage the poor, not to eliminate or to elevate the poverty. Right? That's one. Number two, uh, whenever in the conventional, uh, conventional discussions, discourses on the uh, poverty, and also in the discussions and the discourses uh, of poverty in the Islamic economic development, yeah, uh, they do not redefine what is the meaning of poverty. Say, for instance, Islamic economic development, they try to overcome the problems of poverty by using zakat or by using wakaf. So definitely zakat and wakaf are the two, uh, are two energetic Islamic uh, institutions that uh, have proven to have uh, be able to overcome the problems of poverty. But the problems are the uh, the the, uh, the the Islamic the recent the the the, the, 
the contemporary Islamic economy is now is that uh, they are using the Islamic institutions to overcome the poverty, but the definition of poverty is not redefined according to Islam. So they're still using the definitions of the conventional economic development of poverty and try to overcome that problems using the Islamic institution. So we can see how 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 Plankabut or how uh, uh, the mixture of that kind of conventional and the so-called Islam, uh, so-called Islamic system or Islamic process. And I think this is not right. So what we need to do is to redefine the concept of poverty according to Islam, and then to cut, uh, to categorize, yeah, um, the poor according to Islam. Also, we'll discuss about that the the categories of the poor uh, later on, yeah, later on, inshallah, in the next slide, yeah. So as I've said just now, that we have to manage the poor, we have to manage the poverty, and we have to redefine the concept of poverty, the concept of the poor according to Islam. And from there, we can categorize uh, the categories of the poor according to Islam, inshallah. So there is another way that we can uh, overcome the challenges of the poverty in the Muslim countries. Number three, uh, we need to have the poor's own perception and definition of poverty. Yeah, because uh, so far, we can see either in the conventional economic development or in Islamic economic development, we always see that actually the definition of poverty comes from the top. Comes from the top, either from the government or from the agencies, yeah, from the NGOs. Yeah, it's not from the poor uh, themselves. The perception of poverty or the perception of poor uh, comes from outsiders rather than from the poor. Uh, that's why a long time ago, uh, I and my colleagues I used to do a research on the poor's perception of poverty. We, we wanted to know what is the perceptions of the poor's of poverty and how they define the poverty. And it was quite interesting because uh, our enumerators used to go to one of the Pachi, uh, one of the elders in one state in Malaysia and asking him uh, a few questions. And then when he asked, why you ask this question? Why do you come to me? And they were saying, uh, we want to help you to overcome your poverty. And uh, you are considered as poor uh, within the government when you list. Uh, so he was very, very angry. So he was saying, oh, who said that I am poor? Uh, if I, I want to eat chicken, the chicken are a lot behind my house. If I want to even have the beef, and uh, I have the cows uh, yeah, beside my house. Uh, if I want to eat fish, and then uh, at the back of my house also there are there is a river that I can always catch a fish for my food, and uh, I also cultivate uh, paddy, and then I can always eat it. That everything I need, I have it. And our mother was saying, but you don't have the money, right? Yes, I don't have the money, but it is not necessary that without the money I am poor because I can fulfill all my sustenance, all my needs. Uh, so you see. You see, this Pachi is not considered himself as poor well because they can fulfill whatever that they want and whatever that he wanted to. Yeah, uh, even though they don't have the money. So the money is not important to him. Uh, the, the important thing is to, to fulfill the needs. Yeah? Uh, so this is the post perception. But then this is quite different. When uh, our animators uh, went to a house, uh, the wife, the names of the wives is included in the list of the poor uh, enlisted by the government. And but then they were surprised to see wow, the house is very big, a bungalow, and in front of the house there are a lot of tractors, there are a lot of uh, lorries. Yeah? And then uh, the Amritas asked Mahomachi, uh, are you by this name? And he, she was saying, yes, I am. And then uh, I say, but uh, you are listed in the poor uh, categories. Uh, and, but we can see that you have a lot, of, you, you have a big house or bungalow, you have a lot of lorries and also tractors. And what she said, she said, yes, um, I am, poor. yes, I am poor because all this, 
the houses, the house, the tractors, the lorries uh, belongs to my husband, not to me. So I don't have anything and therefore I am poor. So you see that there are also people who think that she is poor, she is poor, even though her husband is rich. Uh, that, there is the people with, with that, what we call a kind of satisfaction, yeah? with the satisfaction. And this is also Rama. So in our kind of challenges of the poverty in Muslim countries, we need to ask the poor themselves, what is the perceptions and what is the definition of poverty? Because you can see the old man with the a woman, the definition, the perception of poverty is quite different. And definitely between the two, we need to cater, we need to overcome the problems of the uh, woman rather than with the elder man. Yeah? All right. And lastly, there must be a right blending of top down and bottom up approaches. Uh, so far, many people are hoping for the governments yeah, to do everything for the poor. They have to do everything for the poor. So it is more of a top-down process rather than bottom-up uh, uh, process. So that is also, I think, not right because both the government from the top and the, uh, the, the, the community, the society at the bottom must uh, do their, their, their task to overcome the problems of the party in this country so that the people down are not dependent on the government itself. Yeah. Uh, so these uh, the four factors that I think we need to consider in order to to open it to 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 overcome the challenges of the poverty Muslim countries. And lastly, uh, in order to do this, whenever that we do these four things, and then when it comes to a kind of a diagrams, uh, we categorize the the, 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 the categories of the poor. And then we can identify which categories, which group of the poor that we need to uh, put attention to uh, more than the others. Yeah. So, right, we were saying that whenever we discuss about the poverty, we need to take into consideration the soul factors, the spiritual factors, and also the economic factors or the material factors. So that's why in the categories one, two, three, four, we divide it into soul and wealth, and then we have the knots on the right. So there are people who are rich in soul, and then also who are rich in wealth. So these people uh, is the most commendable category that we need to create yeah, at our country, in our country, in our community. Uh, we should produce such a people as many as possible. Meaning that we try to overcome the problems of poverty by, be, by, by becoming them to be rich, but at the same time, the spirituality is also high. Yeah, the faith is also very strong. Uh, so the soul is also rich, and also the wealth is also rich. So we are not worried about this kind of people. And in fact, this is the group of people that want to produce in our country, inshallah. Uh, there are also second category uh, who are rich in soul but poor in wealth. So we can see that kind of Pachi just now again. Uh, his soul is very, very, very rich, inshallah. Uh, even though they are poor in our eyes because they, uh, he is poor, he, he is poor in our eyes because he uh, doesn't have uh, any money. Uh, so this one also can be allowed to exist out. Uh, out of his own choice, since he's able to live without burdening the state and society. Yeah? Uh, so relax and uh, allow them to be what he wants to be. All right. The other one is the poor in soul and poor in wealth. And this is the most problematic groups. Yeah? This is the most negative category and the most needing help. Uh, and then, in fact, substantial parts of the state's allocation should be allocated for them. Because it's not also they are they are not also poor in wealth in in in, uh, in economy, but also the spiritual, uh, their spirit, spirituality is also poor. Uh, so this is the first category that we need to concentrate on, yeah, to take into account, yeah, and to have a, a special allocation for them to overcome. And number four is the poor in soul and rich in wealth. Uh, in a, 
uh, the rich people without faith. Uh, this is the second most negative category. Uh, and then also substantial parts of the state's education should also be allocated to them, uh, despite of their richness, so as to allow them to increase the richness of their souls, so that their richness could benefit the state and society as a whole. So, um, in this we can see that actually in the Islamic management of the poverty uh, in an economic, Islamic economic development, it is not the poor people that we need to overcome their problems, especially the number three, the, the category, the group three, but also the group four. So we need to also take care of the rich, of the rich who are having the poor faith. Uh, so the first degree, definitely those people who are poor in wealth and also in soul. But then the second is the who are rich in wealth, but poor in soul. Uh, so meaning that we need to cater and we need to improve the soul of the rich. Uh, because if, we, if they remain like that, they are not able to, to, to help the poor. But then if their faith are increased, and inshallah, they, they will distribute their, their wealth to the poor. Uh, and inshallah, they will help the poor. And therefore, uh, they can benefit the states and also the society as a whole, right? So uh, this kind of categories, uh, so far, I haven't seen in any uh, effort in overcoming the problems of poverty in the Muslim poor, uh, despite uh, also in the Islamic, the so-called Islamic economic development. All right, I think that's all that uh, I need to say.